Welcome to Empowered. We are so glad that you joined us today. I'm Ron Simpson, and I'm with Mabel Dunbar today, and we will be the hosts of this particular show. And Mabel, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. All right, good deal, <laughs> good deal. Well, today we are going to be talking about the battering cycle, mm -hmm. and we are going to be uh, going through the phases of this uh, as it applies to domestic violence. And so I think we'll dive right into this information, Mabel. And uh, real quickly, what are the three phases? First of all, we have the tension building. Then we have the a battering or incident phase. And then we have the honeymoon phase. And because it's a cycle, we go right back to the tension building phase. And so this cycle, until it's interrupted, of course, mm -hmm. um, continues on. It does. Um, I think it's easy for people to believe that when it comes to domestic violence that it always exists. Is it possible that you can go maybe years without this cycle starting up before it kicks in? Uh, or is that a little unusual? It's unusual, but it happens where there can be an incident for, you know, for, uh, you know, let's say an incident happens three months ago and then it might take a year it could take five years some people it could be seven years before a really bad incident happened but keep in mind that throughout the process there are little things little indicators that are always there to keep the victim alert so it may be very subtle it, it's yep and I noticed that saying that um, I noticed that in the very first phase which we call the Pad, tension, the building. tension building, it's right. the tension building phase. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things in here, it talks about minor incidents. incidents. Right. Um, these are such as what? Oh, um, you know, putting putting the victim down, being critical. Uh, I'm saying things like, you know, the food didn't taste really good. Or um, saying, you know, well, what happened to you today? How come you didn't get your work done? Just little things that, that are picked at to make her feel. On, and, of course, we, for clarification purposes, we refer to the victim as she and the abuser as he. But we know that it can go either way. Either can be victim or abuser. But just little things, um, criticism, putting her down, making her feel that she's um, not capable, uh, making her feel that she's not good enough for certain things, that she needs to come up to the mark. Just very, very subtle things. I was talking to somebody about our program, and one of the things that they asked me was, and it's a good question, when you talk about domestic abuse, or you're talking about psychological, or you're talking about physical, and I said both, <laughs> uh -huh. and, it, it, and so I'm going to ask you, is that, is that the correct answer, particularly in these minor incidences? It sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is psychological, but I'm guessing that there can probably be some minor physical altercations as well. Oh, of course. And remember, one of the reasons why abuse continues, it's not that blatant. If it was blatant where, you know, somebody just hit somebody or slapped somebody out in the public, they'll be taken to jail. But the reason why domestic, and we talked about domestic and what domestic means, the reason why um, domestic violence is so dangerous and it's so subtle, you can't really pinpoint it and also it occurs in the home environment and we don't see it and so we we just assume that unless it's something that's really big and causes a whole pile of problems and somebody goes to jail then it's not abuse but abuse is very subtle and it, and the psychological abuse by the way having worked with victims victims for so many years they tell me that the worst form of abuse is the psychological and emotional because that's something that's always in your head you're always hearing those messages you're always thinking about how you've been treated thinking about the thoughts that have been been projected on you so it, it's pretty dangerous and in most situations physical violence starts with the psychological starts out with psychological yes, yes. the verbal abuse the emotional abuse yeah one of the things that we've talked about in the past is about how life experience kind of sets people up mm -hmm. to, to, I don't like to use the expression play out, but it, it does do that. It plays out in the lives of both the 
abuser and the victim. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in this first phase, the tension building phase, that the victim tends to try and uh, avoid or uh, calm the situation down. Why is it a victim would try to pacify the situation as, a, as opposed to running away? We have to always remember this is a relationship where people genuinely love each other. They want the relationship to work. They want to they want to do everything that they can to keep the family together, to keep the marriage working. And so even though we, and we talked about a pattern and even though this is a cycle which is a pattern after a while the individuals who are in this cycle in this pattern they know what to expect. And many times the victim does have some control because she, because she's been through this cycle for so many times, she knows what to say, how to say, what to do to sometimes avoid uh, uh, an abusive episode. And sometimes she can, but most of the time she cannot. But she loves her husband or her, her partner or, you know, her, her significant other, and she wants the relationship to work. And what she'll do is try to find every means possible to avert the inevitable. We had an interview here one time uh, with a young lady, and I found it interesting that one of the comments that she made, uh, at least I'm paraphrasing it, mm -hmm. but one of the things that she said was that it wasn't until she got out of the situation that she could look back and see who she was in the situation. That's right. I'm going to guess that that's probably pretty common. Oh, absolutely. And like, remember, it's a cycle. And, and when you keep on going into this cycle, it becomes like a pattern. It becomes normal. And so you expect it and you know what's going to happen at the end. And of course, we're going to talk about that honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. And they know what's going to happen. They know what to expect. So most victims feel that they're strong enough that they're able to handle it. And so they'll stay in, in the cycle. Over the years, I, you know, I've run into, I, I guess like many people, we run into so many different situations, particularly um, along the lines of domestic abuse, where we, even as outsiders, can recognize uh, some of the symptoms mm -hmm. of what's going on in people's lives. I know denial is a, is a huge, and I would guess denial on the part of the victim because uh, embarrassment is probably part sure. of it. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that you wrote in your phase cycles in the in the first uh, uh, the tension mm -hmm. si uh, phase was that they are not interested in reality the reality is that their their reality is that it's a cycle and 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 I have to keep on reminding you of that it's a cycle they're not necessarily interested in ending the relationship what they want to do is end the abuse. They want the abuse to stop. They don't want to be hurt. They don't want to be beaten. And so even though, and it might sound a little bit crazy, but even though they know that there's a possibility that they'll be beaten, they will still try to avert the inevitable. And that's what we mean when we say they're not, they're not thinking about reality. All they want is, I need my relationship to work. I, I want to stay married. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want him to be beaten. I don't want to be beaten. What can I do to stop that part of it? But the ultimate goal, and, and remember, we're referring to victims as women, but the ultimate goal for that victim is to avert the abuse, stop the abuse, and get back to a loving relationship, if there ever is. And of course, because we're going to talk about the honeymoon cycle, we know there is a point where love, or I don't know if I want to say love so much as, but there's the calming part where you know he's loving he's kind he's compassionate and she yearns for that and so she's willing to go through that abusive part in order to get to that nice part so you have a an abuser who is trying to control and you have a victim that is also that's trying right. to control that's um, right give us an example of that because you've got two controlling factions coming at each other but they're clearly coming from two different perspectives. That's right. She's coming from a perspective of controlling the environment. 
so that the abuse doesn't occur. So she'll make sure that, you know, his clothes are washed, that, that she prepares the best meal that she can, that anything he wants, he gets. And she'll get upset with people around the environment who don't enter into what she's going through in order to create this environment where he can feel safe, he can be happy, and his needs are met. On the other hand, the abuser, something, something probably happened at work, or, you know, he might have gotten um, close to an accident, or somebody said something terrible to him, or his feelings was hurt, or whatever happens, but he's angry, he's upset, and he feels put down, he feels inadequate, and his anger has to go someplace, and that anger goes towards the victim. One of the things that we... Um that we see in in a lot of situations, particularly when there's an emotional outburst, is that there's triggers. Yeah. And let's talk about triggers for just a minute. Um, what types of things are going to trigger an abuser to lash out? And the reason why I ask that, it may sound obvious, um, but I have a I have a thought. And that is, is that if somebody is prone to getting their way <laughs> by controlling through violence, then that may be who they are and what they've learned and what they've become. Not that they can't change. I'm not suggesting that. Right. But I'm saying if an individual is, is that way, it may not take a trigger to set that off. I could be wrong on that. Explain what triggers are and is there more than just the obvious things, you know, the, for example, you said the clothes weren't washed or laid out or the dinner's not cooked. Um, those are sound more like somebody not getting their way. Well, the trigger is, the trigger might not necessarily be those little things. The trigger is, like I mentioned before, um, you know, he's driving and somebody gets in his way. He can't control that person. Or he has a boss who tells him what to do and what he cannot do. He cannot control that boss, and so he gets angry. It's just little things or, um, or many things in his life that he has no control over. But because he, he has learned that violence gets him what he wants, and he has also learned that he could take out violence on some people and not other people, those individuals that he can take his anger out on violently, he can do that. And so if he is not able to manipulate and control somebody else who might be more powerful, he'll take his anger out, his feelings of inadequacy, his feeling that he ha doesn't have control, he'll take that out on somebody else. It's, you know, as I think about domestic violence and um, so many things I've read, I just feel that it's added, uh, it's summed up really, really great when it says the, the intent is power and control. If, if I don't have power and control over my life, I will seek to have power and control over someone or something. And so the abuser, when he feels that he does not have control, um, power over a situation or over a person. He gets very angry and sometimes gets very violent and he'll seek somebody that's weaker that he can manipulate and control. When I hear you describing um, somebody who's out of control like that, it almost reminds me of what they call the terrible twos in children is that... But he's not out of control. That's, that's the, that is the crazy part about it. Remember, he's able to control his temper at work. Oh, that's, that's absolutely true. He's able to yeah. control his temper when he's driving. He, he could put on those brakes. And there are many people who feel that when an abuser abuses, he's out of control. It's calculated. He knows exactly what he's doing. So this thing about, you know, I don't know what I'm doing or I, um, because I'm drinking or it's not true. They know exactly what they're doing. They, they target their uh, um, victim. And that is why they take it out on people who are weaker. They don't take it out on people who are stronger. That's excellent clarification. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because I believe that a lot of people, when you talk about people as they're describing situations, there's, they say that it's, it's a person that's out of control or that they never learned this or that. But what, what you're telling me is it's a learned behavior. It's a learned behavior. To get what you want. That's right. And to manipulate. The last little section that you had in your, in your write up on um, the tension building phase talked about postponing. Uh, and it sounds kind of like avoidance to me. 
Um, is that a, is there a similarity there, or are we talking about something different? Um, I don't I don't know if it's. I think it is avoidance to a certain extent. But the the thing is, when they have been through this cycle long enough, they know the inevitable is going to happen. I mean, the victim knows that if she's not able to control the abuse up to a point that the incident is going to occur. So the postponing is trying to put it off as long as I can as a victim, hoping that I can change his mind, hoping that something I might say or do will stop the behavior. But the fact of the matter is, when someone is seeking power and control, it's very difficult to stop them when they are calculate, they have calculated in their mind that they're gonna get their way. So we've talked about the tension building phase. It's time to move on to the second phase. And this is the acute battering incident. And this is the shortest phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. Uh, it also might be the saddest yeah, uh, phase it is. it is too, because uh, we have obviously a description here of playing out the violence. And as we look at this um, particular phase on here, um, it says in the tension building phase, there's a point where the victim can no longer control the environment. Now we've been talking about calculated control. Now we're talking about where are they out of control now? And because is that is that what we've gone to? It's almost like losing the mind phase here. Yeah, blind I, fury maybe. Yeah, it, it's to the point where they've been in this cycle for so long, and it's become such a pattern that what they were able to control up to a certain point now, it's it's just gone. And and for the victim, and this is the phase where uh, some people say that she asked for it because the victim would say, okay, I've done everything. I can't stop him. Just hit me. She'll say things like that or, she, or she'll do something to agitate him so that he would just um, blow off on her. And this is where in, in a domestic violence situation, when we, talk, when we talk about the police coming, that's when we see the victim might do something. She might slap him. And then he said, you see, she's the one that's the abuser. She's the one that hit me. She's the, the terrible one. It's not me. When all of this time, he's, this tension has been built up, she can't take it anymore. And she says, just go ahead and do it. And so when she does something like hit the abuser, he tells the police, well, she hit me. And of course she did. But people are not looking at what, what has taken her to that point. And for her, it's a release. It's like, I cannot stay on this high, strong, emotional level anymore. Just do it. Get it over with. It's very difficult for me as, as I listen to that. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sure it's probably difficult for a lot of people to understand. If you love somebody, why would you do that to them? It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. But, you know, as a Christian and, and working as a Christian therapist, I always go back to the point that it's a sin issue and sin does not make any sense. But, you know, when you say you love somebody, why would you want to hurt that person? And so this whole twisted thinking of, of domestic violence and abuse issues and how a woman can stay in, in it, it's very, very difficult. And sometimes people think a woman is crazy. But you have to understand the dynamics. The bottom line for this person and both of these people in, in the relationship is that they genuinely care for each other, but they have not learned how to show that affection in appropriate ways. Remember, it's a learned behavior. And so when, when we as adults and as parents don't pattern healthy behaviors for our children, they grow up with a twist, twisted um, concept of what love really is because mom and daddy could fight tonight and tomorrow I see them hugging and kissing. And so for me, oh, but they love each other. You know, you know, so it's it, it, it's a challenge to deal with it and to explain to people. It's taken me years, and I am still learning. Some of my clients still surprise me. Okay, so this this phase is set off by an external or internal right. event. Explain that. It could be something that happened to him, something someone did to him, or it could be we talked about triggers, or it could be something that. Um, she said or something that she did or it could be um, you know just a movement by someone or, or, or a memory that he has and that memory could have could bring bring up such pain 
and such anger that he explodes. Through the process of the battering incident, you have a cycle that's going on. And if, if the couple have been together long enough, they're going to recognize yeah. those cycles. They're going to recognize yeah. those patterns. It almost comes across as if they know what to expect. Let's yeah. go through the process. Let's yeah. get it over with. Yeah. Where in the world does that kind of thinking come from? It comes from the ideology that the victim has been put down so much that she feels he's the only option for her. Nobody else is going to love her. She's so messed up. She's so tainted. She's so bad that she might as well just settle for this relationship because nobody else wants her. She's been told that over and over again. And her self-esteem is so low that she begins to believe that it's better at least to take this abuse and have somebody than not have anyone at all. One of the questions a lot of people are going to ask, and, and I think I've even said this myself th throughout our interviews, whether it's today or, or other yeah. times that we've interviewed, is why doesn't the victim just leave? And I, th I, think, I'm, I, th I think that people can start understanding that there's mm -hmm. learned behavior on both sides. That's right. And we've set ourselves into a situation that's really playing in to what we've become. Why doesn't the victim just leave? Probably, I would say, from what I have heard and studied and experienced with my clients, fear. They have been told that if you leave me, I will kill you, I will kill your children, I will kill your parents. They are afraid and they believe everything that the abusers say. Sometimes they lack the social skills. They've been isolated. Where do they go? Go. Um, how do people treat them? Lack of money. Lack of where to go. Um, you know, they, they don't know about resources. Um, the stigma of not being married, of, of having children. How do I take care of my children? And especially if these people are, you know, pretty well off, how are you going to ask somebody who's used to living in a beautiful home with cars, with money, to leave and go to a shelter where she might have to share a room with somebody else? It's not that simple. And I, I always, when people ask, people have asked me this question year in and year out, Mabel, why doesn't she leave? And my question to them, you're not supposed to answer a question with a question, <laughs> but my question to them is, what are we doing to help her leave? Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this program. Exactly. Is to help people to understand that there are resources that's and right. there are avenues available. There's people out there that do want to help you and want to help you in this particular situation, uh, especially I'm... when it comes to safety uh, and yeah. when it comes to getting somebody in a better situation yeah. where they're safe. And people understand because these women have been victims, and I say a woman, but men are victims too. But these victims have been isolated for so long, they think they're the only one going through this. Nobody else will understand. And so if I leave him, I'm not going to get the help or support anyway because nobody would ever believe I'm going through this. That's a myth. And the abuser makes the victim feel that um, it's her fault, she's the problem, and everybody will see as a problem. But there, I just want everybody to know there's a lot of help out there, and we just want people to access the help so that they can be safe. One of the things that you just said um, got me to thinking that I think it's, it might be easy for people, to, for some people anyway, to imagine that a lot of these things are, are happening in poverty and in situations where people don't have a lot, their resources are limited. I don't think that's the case. Not I think, necessarily. I think we could safely say that uh, people in all walks of life are having oh, yeah. to deal with this. It doesn't matter. There's been some pretty high profile cases in the media, uh, particularly nationwide, about very successful people that's right. that are dealing with this. And, and I'll tell you, that's probably not the place you want to see your picture on uh, <laughs> when those yeah. things happen. Yeah. But that's what we're hearing and seeing. It can it's, happen to anybody. It's, and it's, very, it's a very serious, subtle th problem that we, we are facing. Now, when we're talking about these phases, I noticed that uh, right smack in my, my resources, it says this is the time 
for intervention? This is definitely the time for intervention, and this is when I get the women calling me because she's probably running for her life. She feels that he's going to kill her. Her children might be in jeopardy, and she reaches out and she calls for help. But if she doesn't call for help and she stays, we get to that third phase, the honeymoon phase. But, you know, it's, it's so important for women and even victims, even men who are victims, for them to reach out and help at this phase because they might never even get to the honeymoon phase because this is the phase during which um, death can occur. Wow. All right, we've gotten to the third phase, the honeymoon. I, I don't know if I like that title. Because wow. <laughs> that, that sounds, honeymoons are supposed to be good. Yeah, well, some people call it calming phase, but the honeymoon, this phase is really, really good. Oh, man, he is so sorry for, for, for his abuse. She's probably left, and he's going to do everything he can to get her back. So he'll enlist the aid of everybody. He's the most charming, the most loving, the most compassionate. And he says he'll never do it again. And the crazy thing about it, he be actually believes that. He will never, ever hit her again. He will be the most wonderful husband. And he buys her everything that, that she could imagine. She could run up the credit card. She can do whatever it is she wants. And he'll get the pastor. He'll get the church members. He'll get the counselors. He'll get people like me and call me and tell me, you know, I will never do this again. Thank you so much for helping my wife. But she can come home. I'm safe now. And if she goes back too early without um, getting the help that she needs and without him getting the help that he needs, we go right back to the attention building phase. I'm kind of curious when somebody approaches you and they're talking that way. What do you say to them? It depends. If I know who the person is, I, I, I speak pretty boldly. But if I don't know, if I don't know the person, I said, you know what, if you really if you really care about her and you really love her, why don't you let her make that decision when she's ready to come home? Oh, excellent answer too. Okay, so this is something that I, I, I think a lot of people have probably dealt with this in their lives. They'll, they'll come across a situation where clearly things are not right between a couple and the, the victim, which I have witnessed myself, will be be uh, very outspoken about what's going on. They may not be talking in great description, but clearly there's problems. They they have they have vocalized it, and people all around them are saying, "Look at you can see that the abuser is trying to charm you back into the situation, but it's almost as if they are, you know." totally taken back again. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why it's called the honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. um, but why? Why Why would a, an abused person, uh, and maybe this is the same answer I'm going to get that yeah, I asked yeah. earlier, you why are. don't they leave? Well, the, the, the answer you're going to get is that they genuinely love the abuser. They genuinely believe that this time he really means it and he's going to change. And I mean, what do you do when you love somebody and that person comes in front of you and they kneel down in front of you and they cry and they beg you and they say, I am so sorry, I'll never do this again. And even though you've been through the cycle over and over again, you want to believe that this time is different. But one of the things we encourage victims to know is that each time you go through that cycle, you get a little bit weaker, you get a little bit weaker, but the abuser gets a little bit stronger, gets a little bit stronger until it's very, very difficult for them to get out of their cycle. So the stronger the, victim, the abuser gets, the weaker the victim gets, and they are still drawn to each other. There might be a lot of um, pieces here as to why an individual might be reluctant to leave an abuser. We could say children. Sure. That would, that would make Finances. a huge bond. Uh, yeah, well, marriage itself, yeah. obviously, because yeah. we're not always talking about marriage situations. Clearly, we're talking about um, any domestic situation. Religion. Um, religion, yes. There's a lot of things. Well, and, and probably the embarrassment, because yeah. I know as, as I have researched this, uh, this topic, uh, religion seems to play a huge <laughs> part. And we talked about that uh, before, uh, how religion can really... Mm -hmm. uh, 
people can use religion to... And text. And I think we're going to do a program on that, how texts are used out of context to exactly. try and force a, a victim to stay in an abusive relationship. So as we look at those different components and whatnot, I guess we can say that that, realistically, that would, would make it difficult sure. um, to, to withdraw from that. But I, I was looking at, and this is talking to a counselor, of course. I'm, I'm asking, uh, I work with lots of counselors. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, one of the things I've heard you say uh, is, is that, you know, people are not going to change unless they really want to. I noticed that in this honeymoon cycle, and you mentioned this just a few minutes ago, and that is, is that when you have an individual who offers to go to counseling uh, so that he can control the behavior or stop the behavior or however you want to uh, say that, um, why isn't that working? Why does that not work with an individual? I know we just said you got to want to, but it seems to me like there'd be something more powerful out there that could convince somebody that this is really not the way you want to be. This motive. Is motive? Motive. His, it's not that he wants to change his behavior. What he wants to do is to manipulate the victim to come back. So he'll go through all of the motions. And of course, you know, when, when there's a, a problem or when there's a relational issue, what you do, you go to counseling or you go to your pastor and, and you go to your friends. And that's what he does. He'll, he'll go to all of these entities and he'll, he'll pretend that he seriously is sorry and he wants to change. But the reason I say that change takes place when a person wants to, just saying I want to change does not mean that I will change. Changing a behavior that you've had for 10, 15, 20, 30 years takes more than two or three counseling sessions. Well, we've heard that um, abusers are quite manipulative, and That's I right. think what you're describing to us is, is what manipulation is in a situation like this. One of the descriptions of this honeymoon cycle is intimacy and how it intensifies. Yes. Uh, why is that? Well, because they've hurt each other, they are sorry for what has happened, they renew their vows, they renew their commitment to each other, and it's like a renewal of the relationship. And so it's a celebration of a new start. It sounds like it's on false pretense, though. Even though the motive many times for the abuser is not truly to change, but many times he really believes that he's starting over. He really believes that he understands the cycle. He, he really feels that he's got a handle on it and he will never, ever do it again. Deep down in his heart, he believes that. But at the same time, coupled with that, the belief is still, okay, I'm going to change, but I still want to have control. Yeah. There's no willingness to put anything in place to alter the behavior. Right. When this phase is over, complete, so we, mm -hmm. we've, we've gone through a honeymoon cycle where the, an incident took place just prior to it, and, and now you have remorse, or at least Mm -hmm. It might be suspect, but there is remorse uh, on either side. What we see then after that is a repeat of each yeah. one of these phases yeah. until either something bad happens or until somebody gets out of the situation. Yeah. And remember, during the honeymoon phase, what actually happens is that he does everything he can to please her. And I mentioned before, she can use a credit card. Well, the bills are going to come in. OK, she can um, buy the clothes and she can do all of these things that she's really wanting to do. But the bills are going to come in. And so the frustration level is going to start up again. So he makes all these promises, whatever you want, honey, you can do. But then reality comes in. You know, I've got to take care of these things. And then she might do something to trigger him again or something might happen. So because the behavior has not changed. The cycle continues because tension is going to start again because the behavior has not changed, and 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 maybe I not be, I shouldn't say that, the behavior changes for a time. But it's not it has not taken root in the person's heart or in the person's mentality, and so, very easily, something can trigger it and the tension starts again. 
It, it seems to me that most of the difference is going to be made by the victim getting out of the situation as opposed to expecting the abuser to change. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. It is a fair statement, and I, and I think that's why you have so, so many domestic violence programs, so many of us as, as advocates trying to encourage the woman to leave because as she stays, she's targeted. She is, she is actually um, giving the abuse a target. If she's gone, he, you know, what is he going to do? And, and so he, he's projecting his anger on her. So when she's gone, then he has to find another way to project his anger. But unfortunately, even though the victim is the one that is being victimized and being abused, we, we really encourage her to take the first step to get out of that abusive relationship and to help mend the relationship if it can be mended or to end it if it needs to be ended. You get to a point in the relationship where the cycle continues it's got to weary somebody along the, along the yeah. way. And I noticed one of the comments that was made in, in regards to this in the resource material is that self-esteem decreases among both of both the individuals. Of them. Yeah. And is, is that typically the, 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 the breaking point in a situation like that, particularly with the victim, that they are at that point where they can take no more? Um, is, that, is that the norm? in a situation like that? Is that typically what causes somebody to seek and get help? Not necessarily. Um, many times women get help not because, they, they, not because of the abuse they get, but because of their children. Oh. They would leave to protect their children. They, they would stick because, remember, they stay because of the children. They want to make sure that their children get, get a home, good education, all of the, you know, um, comforts in, in life, but check a victim, especially a woman, a ma ma um, female victim, when you mess with her kids, that's when she's ready to do anything to protect her children. And so sometimes we have to tell the, tell the victim, you know, even if you don't want to leave for yourself, leave for your children. And I want to clarify this because I, you know, I mentioned before that this whole thing of domestic violence is a sin issue. And I want to address this because <clears throat> Even though it might seem that the abuser man, if he's male, is all powerful, he still has low self-esteem. And he does not, it's not that he's happy for everything he's doing either. His self-esteem is low. He just does not know how to stop it because that's the behavior he's learned. That's how he understands to get power and to get control. And when, and I've worked with men, I mean, <laughs> I remember doing a group with about 12 men and Initially, I was scared, scared to do it, but then as, as I continued doing this, I realized that these men, they really want to change, most of them. They just didn't know how to, and they were not humble enough to seek help because they're supposed to be these macho men, you know, that I can handle it and I can take care of my emotions. So both, both parties, their self-esteem does, does um, decrease. So we've covered the three phases of uh, domestic violence. We talked about the tension building phase, and we talked about the battering, battering incident, incidents. and we talked about the honeymoon cycle. Um, obviously, we you know, did not uh, cover these completely or exhaustively, but um, we hope we've laced, at least been able to give you some insight into this pattern and as well the resources, if it's something that you're aware of or involved with that you can uh, and we, help you need as and well. we have resources. You know, pe we have handouts that if people are interested in getting um, some of these handouts, like you were referring to um, the resource there, yeah. we, we hope that they would write in and challenge us in what we say. I mean, you know, we don't, we, don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, didn't ha we don't have all the answers and maybe some things, um, you know, we need education ourselves as we try to educate the community. Well, we want to thank you for joining us today. I, I guess I want to ask Mabel, is there any last word you'd like to say or do you feel like we've covered it pretty well? Well, I would just like to say if um, there are individuals listening to us and they uh, are in an abusive relationship and they understand the cycle a little bit better, that they will contact us and we will try to help them as much as we can. All right. Thank you for joining us today. We so much appreciate you viewing our program today. God has not given any of us the spirit of fear, but his spirit of love, 
power and a sound mind. Therefore, we are pleased to provide this ministry to help you and others in your journey of healing from abuse. In order to continue doing this, we depend on financial support from viewers like you. Your donation is tax deductible and can be sent by a check or money order to our mailing address at Women's Healing and Empowerment Network or WHE Network, PO Box 9637, Spokane, Washington, 99209. You can also visit our website at whenetwork.com and click on the donation button. For your gift of $25 or more, we will send you a special token of our appreciation. Thank you for your prayers. May God continue to bless you and yours as you partner with us to help empower abused lives.